Unit 1. Number 1. It is important to recognize your pet's particular needs and respect them. If your pet is an athletic, high-energy dog, for example, he or she is going to be much more manageable indoors if you take him or her outside to chase a ball for an hour every day. If your cat is shy and timid, he or she won't want to be dressed up and displayed in cat shows. Similarly, you cannot expect macaws to be quiet and still all the time. They are, by nature, loud and emotional creatures, and it is not their fault that your apartment doesn't absorb sound as well as a rainforest. Number 2. Patients should be aware that there can be differing views among specialists about who should be treated for various conditions. For example, expert committees in Europe and the United States set different guidelines about when to treat high blood pressure. The group of American experts believed that for mild elevation of blood pressure, the benefits exceeded the risks from treatment. They wrote guidelines suggesting that patients with mild blood pressure elevation take medicine. But in Europe, an expert committee with access to the same scientific data set different guidelines that don't advise treatment for mild elevation of blood pressure. In Europe, people with the same symptoms would not be encouraged to take medicine. Different groups of experts can disagree significantly about what is best practice. Number 3. We become more successful when we are happier and more positive. For example, doctors put in a positive mood before making a diagnosis show almost three times more intelligence and creativity than doctors in a neutral state, and they make accurate diagnoses 19% faster. Salespeople who are optimistic sell more than those who are pessimistic by 56%. Students who are made to feel happy before taking math achievement tests perform much better than their neutral peers. It turns out that our brains are literally programmed to perform at their best, not when they are negative or even neutral, but when they are positive. Number 4. A snack with the label 99% natural seems more appealing than it would if labeled 1% unnatural. A frozen dinner labeled 75% fat-free would sell better than it would with the label 25% fat. The less appealing labeling option is just as accurate as the more appealing option. It also makes us reflect more about what we might be eating. Similarly, bets sound less appealing when framed in terms of the chances of losing or the amount of money one might lose, rather than the chances of winning or the amount of money one would win. Medical procedures may sound scarier when presented in terms of the risk of dying, rather than the likelihood of coming through unharmed. Therefore, it is a useful exercise to recompute losses in terms of gains or gains in terms of losses. Exercise number one. Sometimes we find a piece of writing hard to understand and we need to make the meaning clear, which is possible through simulation. A classic example is car insurance people. They read the reports of accidents and have to figure out who is legally responsible for the accidents. While nowadays they probably use computer simulation, at one time they would use toy cars and drawings of the roads. They would move the toy cars and note the damage that would occur according to the reports from the drivers making claims. In this case, the simulation makes the written material more understandable by presenting it in a visual way. To study a text better, you can use simulation with any convenient objects. Exercise number two. Although most people, including Europe's Muslims, have numerous identities, few of these are politically salient at any moment. It is only when a political issue affects the welfare of those in a particular group that identity assumes importance. For instance, 
When issues arise that touch on women's rights, women start to think of gender as their principal identity. Whether such women are American or Iranian, or whether they are Catholic or Protestant matters less than the fact that they are women. Similarly, when famine and civil war threaten people in sub-Saharan Africa, many African Americans are reminded of their kinship with the continent in which their ancestors originated centuries earlier, and they lobby their leaders to provide humanitarian relief. In other words, each issue calls forth somewhat different identities that help explain the political preferences people have regarding those issues. Unit Two, Number One, at the 2015 Fortune Most Powerful Women Summit, Ginny Rometty offered this advice: When did you ever learn the most in your life? What experience? I guarantee you'll tell me it was a time you felt at risk. To become a better leader, you have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to challenge the conventional ways of doing things and search for opportunities to innovate. Exercising leadership not only requires you to challenge the organizational status quo, but also requires you to challenge your internal status quo. You have to challenge yourself. You have to venture beyond the boundaries of your current experience and explore new territory. Those are the places where there are opportunities to improve, innovate. Experiment and grow. Growth is always at the edges, just outside the boundaries of where you are right now. Number two, changing our food habits is one of the hardest things we can do because the impulses governing our preferences are often hidden, even from ourselves. And yet, adjusting what you eat is entirely possible. We do it all the time. Were this not the case, the food companies that launch new products each year would be wasting their money. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, housewives from East and West Germany tried each other's food products for the first time in decades. It didn't take long for those from the East to realize that they preferred Western yogurt to their own. Equally, those from the West discovered a liking for the honey and vanilla wafer biscuits of the East. From both sides of the wall, these German housewives showed a remarkable flexibility in their food preferences. Number three, if you're an expert, having a high follower count on your social media accounts enhances all the work you are doing in real life. A great example is a comedian. She spends hours each day working on her skill, but she keeps being asked about her Instagram following. This is because businesses are always looking for easier and cheaper ways to market their products. A comedian with 100,000 followers can promote her upcoming show and increase the chances that people will buy tickets to come see her. This reduces the amount of money the comedy club has to spend on promoting the show and makes the management more likely to choose her over another comedian. Plenty of people are upset that follower count seems to be more important than talent, but it's really about firing on all cylinders. In today's version of show business, the business part is happening online. You need to adapt because those who don't adapt won't make it very far. Number four. Many writers make the common mistake of being too vague when picturing a reader. When it comes to identifying a target audience, everyone is no one. You may worry about excluding other people if you write specifically for one individual. Relax, that doesn't necessarily happen. A well-defined audience simplifies decisions about explanations and word choice. Your style may become more distinctive. In a way that attracts people beyond the target reader, for example, Andy Weir wrote *The Martian* for science fiction readers who want their stories firmly grounded in scientific fact, and perhaps rocket scientists who enjoy science fiction. I belong to neither audience, yet I enjoyed the book. Weir was so successful at pleasing his target audience that they shared it widely and enthusiastically. 
because Weir didn't try to cater to everyone, he wrote something that delighted his core audience. Eventually, his work traveled far beyond that sphere. It may be counterintuitive, but if you want to broaden your impact, tighten your focus on the reader. Exercise number one. Textiles and clothings have functions that go beyond just protecting the body. Dress and textiles alike are used as a means of nonverbal communication. Obvious examples would be the use of uniforms to communicate our particular social role and the modern white wedding dress Western cultures use to mark this rite of passage. Both types of clothing communicate important information nonverbally to the onlooker. The female wearing the white dress is about to be married and changed her status and role in society. The person in the uniform has some specialized function in society, such as police officer, nurse, or soldier. Therefore, it can be said that clothing visually communicates information about group membership and functions as an identity marker. Exercise number two. Plant and animal species are so diverse that the old saying "beauty is in the eye of the beholder" could be the perfect slogan for nature's bounty. It's easy for most people to see the breathtaking beauty found in the brightly colored wings of butterflies, a field of blooming wildflowers, or a forest of hardwood trees in their autumn glory. But what about snails and their trails of slime, rats with yellow teeth, or spiders that look like fierce aliens? These species are beautiful in their own right, just not in a traditional sense. Recognition of their unique beauty may require setting aside any preconceptions or misconceptions people may have about fungi, insects, or reptiles. People seem to be hardwired to see warm and fuzzy mammals as cute, while often lacking this innate and immediate attraction to the cold-blooded, eight-legged, or egg-laying members of the animal kingdom. Yet beauty is in no short supply among these animals. Unit three. Number one. People often assume erroneously that if a Hasda adult of Tanzania does not know how to solve an algebraic equation, then he must be less intelligent than we are. Yet there is no evidence to suggest that people from some cultures are fast learners and people from others are slow learners. The study of comparative cultures has taught us that people in different cultures learn different cultural content, attitudes, values, ideas, and behavioral patterns, and that they accomplish this with similar efficiency. The traditional Hadza hunter has not learned algebra because such knowledge would not particularly enhance his adaptation to life in the East African grasslands. However, he would know how to track a wounded bush buck that he has not seen for three days and where to find groundwater. Number two. The importance of science has led people to think that objectivity is the best way to see the world, to see the facts without any feelings. However, from a human point of view, objectivity is just another attitude. It is an interpretation that deliberately ignores our feelings. It is very useful to ensure that scientific measurements are taken accurately, and so on. But as far as life is concerned. It is a bit like turning the color off on your TV so that you can see everything in black and white, and then saying that is more truthful. It is not more truthful. It is just a filter that reduces the richness of life. When you turn down the feelings, you also turn down the possibility of enjoyment. Number three. I am sure you have heard something like. You can do anything you want if you just persist long and hard enough. Perhaps you have even made a similar assertion to motivate someone to try harder. Of course, words like these sound good, but surely they cannot be true. Few of us can become the professional athlete, entertainer, or movie star we would like to be. Environmental, physical, and psychological factors limit our potential and narrow the range of things we can do with our lives. 
trying harder cannot substitute for talent, equipment, and method, but this should not lead to despair. Rather, we should attempt to become the best we can be within our limitations. We try to find our niche. By the time we reach employment age, there is a finite range of jobs we can perform effectively. Number 4. Even though media coverage of sports is carefully edited and represented in total entertainment packages, most of us believe that when we see a sport event on television, we are seeing it the way it is. We don't usually think that what we see, hear, and read is a series of narratives and images selected for particular reasons and grounded in the social worlds and interests of those producing the event, controlling the images, and delivering the commentary. Television coverage provides only one of many possible sets of images and narratives related to an event, and there are many images and messages that audiences do not receive. If we went to an event in person, we would see something quite different from the images selected and presented on television, and we would develop our own descriptions and interpretations, which would be very different from those carefully by media commentators. Exercise number one. Many people suppose that to keep bees, it is necessary to have a large garden in the country, but this is a mistake. Bees will, of course, do better in the midst of fruit blossoms in May and white clovers in June than in a city, where they have to fly a long distance to reach the open fields. However, bees can be kept with profit even under unfavorable circumstances. Bees do very well in the suburbs of large cities since the series of flowers in the gardens of the villas allow a constant supply of honey from early spring until autumn. Therefore, almost every person, except those who are seriously afraid of bees, can keep them profitably and enjoyably. Exercise number two. A popular notion with regard to creativity is that constraints hinder our creativity and the most innovative results come from people who have unlimited resources. Research shows, however, that creativity loves constraints. In our own agency, we did the best work when we had limited time and client resources. You had to be more creative just to make everything work harder. I have often said our marketing teams were more creative on $5 million accounts than $100 million accounts. Today, when working with startups, I am amazed at the creativity you have to have when you only have $25,000. Perhaps companies should do just the opposite, intentionally apply limits to take advantage of the creative potential of their people. Unit 4 Number 1 Plastic is extremely slow to degrade and tends to float, which allows it to travel in ocean currents for thousands of miles. Most plastics break down into smaller and smaller pieces when exposed to ultraviolet light, forming microplastics. These microplastics are very difficult to measure once they are small enough to pass through the nets typically used to collect them. Their impacts on the marine environment and food webs are still poorly understood. These tiny particles are known to be eaten by various animals and to get into the food chain. Because most of the plastic particles in the ocean are so small, there is no practical way to clean up the ocean. One would have to filter enormous amounts of water to collect a relatively small amount of plastic. Number 2. The baobab tree is leafless for most of the year and looks very much like it has roots sticking up in the air. There are numerous stories offering explanations of how the tree came to be stuffed in the ground upside down. One of the stories says that after it was planted by God, it kept moving, so God replanted it upside down. There are also countless superstitions among native African people regarding the powers of the tree. Anyone who dares to pick its flower, for instance, will be eaten by a lion. On the other hand, 
If you drink water in which the seeds have been soaked, you will be safe from a crocodile attack. Number 3. Even though the first successful appendectomy was said to have been performed by a British army surgeon in 1735, it wasn't until the 1880s that the procedure was described in medical journals and taught in medical schools. It was a welcome solution to an age-old disease and by the turn of the century was becoming so popular that many surgeons in Europe and America made a reasonable amount of money. Shortly before he died in 1902, the German physician-turned-politician Rudolf Virchow was asked, Is it true that a human being can survive without an appendix? Even though he had not practiced medicine for many years, Virchow stayed in touch with developments in the field. Aware of the increasing popularity of the procedure, he wittily remarked, Human beings, yes, but not surgeons. Number 4. According to Skinner, we too in most aspects of our lives are like pigeons pecking at a button to receive little snacks. And this, according to the cognitive scientist Tom Statford, explains the check-in impulse behind email and other online technologies. Unlike food, email isn't always rewarding. In fact, it is often annoying. Once upon a time, there could be no new email for days at a time. Much of what we get is uninteresting or indeed difficult to deal with. But every so often, we get a message we are very glad to have. That such rewarding email comes unpredictably does not dim its attractiveness or keep us from looking for it. On the contrary, the most effective way of maintaining a behavior is not with a consistent predictable reward, but rather with what is termed variable reinforcement. That is, rewards that vary in their frequency or magnitude. Exercise number one. The problem of amino acid deficiency is not unique to the modern world by any means. Pre-industrial humanity probably dealt with protein and amino acid insufficiency on a regular basis. Sure, large hunted animals such as mammoths provided protein and amino acids aplenty. However, living off big game in the era before refrigeration meant humans had to endure alternating periods of feast and famine. Droughts, forest fires, superstorms, and ice ages led to long threat. The human inability to synthesize such basic things as amino acids certainly worsened those crises and made surviving on whatever was available that much harder. During a famine, it's not the lack of calories that is the ultimate cause of death. It's a lack of proteins and the essential amino acids they provide. Exercise number two. According to Cambodian legends, lions once roamed the countryside attacking villagers and their precious buffalo. And long before the great Khmer Empire began in the 9th century, farmers developed a fierce martial art to defend themselves against the predator. These techniques became bokator, meaning to fight a lion. Bokator is a martial art depicted on the walls of Angkor Wat. There are 10,000 moves to master, mimicking animals such as monkeys, elephants, and even ducks. King Jayavarman VII, the warrior king who united Cambodia in the 12th century, made his army train in Bokator, turning it into a fearsome fighting force. Despite its long tradition in Cambodia, Bokator disappeared when the Khmer Rouge took power in 1975 and executed most of the discipline's masters over the next four years. Unit 5 Number 1 Fast fashion refers to trendy clothes designed, created, and sold to consumers as quickly as possible at extremely low prices. Fast fashion items may not cost you much at the cash register, but they come with a serious price. Tens of millions of people in developing countries, some just children, work long hours in dangerous conditions to make them, in the kinds of factories often labeled sweatshops. Most garment workers are paid barely enough to survive. 
Fast fashion also hurts the environment. Garments are manufactured using toxic chemicals and then transported around the globe, making the fashion industry the world's second largest polluter, after the oil industry. And millions of tons of discarded clothing piles up in landfills each year. Number 2. We all have a tendency to look at our own flaws with a magnifying glass. If you continually tell yourself that this or that part of you is not up to standard, how can you expect it to get any better? Focus on the things you like about yourself. You will see how much better it feels to praise yourself rather than put yourself down. With this good feeling, you can do more for yourself and others than you could ever do with the negative energy of self criticism. Choose to see the good. The choice is yours alone. Number 3. Whenever you find yourself reacting differently than you would if you had unlimited time, you're acting out of neediness and won't be reading people clearly. Stop and consider alternative courses of action before you go forward. It's often best to find a temporary solution to begin with and decide on a permanent one later. The parents urgently seeking childcare could put their immediate efforts into convincing a friend or a family member to help out for a week or two, buying them time to look for permanent help. If they can afford it, they can hire a professional nanny for a while. Temporary solutions may be more expensive or inconvenient in the short run, but they'll give you the time you need to make a wise choice about your long term selection. Number 4. Some city planning experts called for legislation against texting while walking that would be followed by a deep change of norms. This recommendation is based on the assumption that this change is welcomed, but laws banning texting while walking failed in Toronto, Arkansas, Illinois, Nevada, New Jersey, and New York. Meanwhile, high tech firms are developing technological solutions to the problem, offering a transparent screen that allows pedestrians to see what is going on in front of them while texting. Another direction for adaptation to the problem was provided by city councils via better urban planning and interventions to generate awareness. Some towns and college campuses have put look up signs in dangerous stairwells and intersections. Hong Kong added announcements in its subway system recommending that passengers look around. New York City reduced speed for cars, and San Francisco fosters pedestrian only corridors. Exercise number one. Too many companies advertise their new products as if their competitors did not exist. They advertise their products in a vacuum and are disappointed when their messages fail to get through. Introducing a new product category is difficult, especially if the new category is not contrasted against the old one. Consumers do not usually pay attention to what's new and different unless it's related to the old. That's why, if you have a truly new product, it's often better to say what the product is not rather than what it is. For example, the first automobile was called a horseless carriage, a name which allowed the public to understand the concept against the existing mode of transportation. Exercise number two. With the general accessibility of photocopiers and student libraries, students tend to copy the relevant material for later use. In such cases, the students are not always selective about what they copy. Often, useless material is gathered that may seem important at the time, but does not seem so in their study room on the night before an exam or essay due date. In addition, when most people photocopy material from books, they feel as if they have actually accomplished something. After all, a few photocopied pages in their notebook now represent information that used to be in a big, thick book. The reality of the situation is that nothing significant has been accomplished yet. The student only has the information in a transportable form. He or she has not learned anything from the material. The information content of the photocopied sheets is just as foreign as if it had been left on the library shelf. 
Unit 6. Number 1. Why doesn't the modern American accent sound similar to a British accent? After all, didn't the British colonize the US? Experts believe that British residents and the colonists who settled America all sounded the same back in the 18th century, and they probably all sounded more like modern Americans than modern Brits. The accent that we identify as British today was developed around the time of the American Revolution by people of low birth rank who had become wealthy during the Industrial Revolution. To distinguish themselves from other commoners, these people developed new ways of speaking to set themselves apart and demonstrate their new elevated social status. In the 19th century, this distinctive accent was standardized as received pronunciation and taught widely by pronunciation tutors to people who wanted to learn to speak fashionably. Number 2. Over the course of the past 40 years, no country on earth has cut its alcohol consumption more than France. While consumption of beer and spirits have stayed basically steady in France, the per capita consumption of alcohol from wine fell from 20 liters in 1962 to about 8 in 2001. One reason for the dwindling wine consumption is the acceleration of the French meal. In 1978, the average French meal lasted 82 minutes. Plenty of time for half a bottle, if not a whole bottle. Today, the average French meal has been slashed down to 38 minutes. Wine is a victim of the disappearance of the leisurely meal. It is not the target of the change, but the decline in wine consumption is a byproduct of the emergence of the faster, more modern, on the go lifestyle. Number 3. Many parents do not understand why their teenagers occasionally behave in an irrational or dangerous way. At times, it seems like teens don't think things through or fully consider the consequences of their actions. Adolescents differ from adults in the way they behave, solve problems, and make decisions. There is a biological explanation for this difference. Studies have shown that brains continue to mature and develop throughout adolescence and well into early adulthood. Scientists have identified a specific region of the brain that is responsible for immediate reactions, including fear and aggressive behavior. This region develops early. However, the frontal cortex, the area of the brain that controls reasoning and helps us think before we act, develops later. This part of the brain is still changing and maturing well into adulthood. Number 4. Because the internet is free space where anybody can post anything, it can be full of all sorts of useless data. As a result, organized knowledge could easily get corrupted or lost in a sea of junk data. For books, there are various filters that help readers distinguish between reliable and unreliable information. On the internet, the relation between the producer and the consumer of information tends to be direct, so nothing protects the consumer from polluted information. There are, of course, advantages to the free exchange of information, and I do believe any producers of data should have the freedom to make them available online. However, I am also convinced that users should be protected from corrupt knowledge by intermediary services. There need to be some forms of guides and filters provided by responsible individuals and organizations. Otherwise, we may no longer be able to distinguish between the intellectual space of information and a polluted environment of meaningless data. Thus, reliable intermediary services will be needed in the future. Exercise number one. Unlike the modern society, the primitive society has less specialized knowledge to transmit. And since its way of life is enacted before the eyes of all, it has no need to create a separate institution of education such as the school. Instead, the child acquires the heritage of his culture by observing and imitating adults in such activities as rituals, hunts, festivals, cultivation, and harvesting. As a result, there is little or none of that alienation of young from old so marked in modern industrial societies. 
A further reason for this alienation in modern societies is that in his conception of reality, the modern adult owes less to his direct experience and more to the experience of his culture than does primitive man. Clearly, his debt to culture will vary with the nature of his education. Hence, the contemporary child must travel much further than the offspring of primitive man to acquire the worldview of his elders. He is, therefore, that much more removed from the adults of his society. Exercise number two. Until the mid 20th century, only a few immigrants paid a visit to their homeland once or twice before they died, but most never returned to the land of their birth. This pattern has completely changed with the advent of globalization, coupled with the digital revolution that has enhanced communication. As a result, immigration is a very different experience from what it was in the past. The ability of immigrant families to reconnect to their old culture via phone, television, and the internet has changed their approach to integration into mainstream American society. This has also greatly influenced immigrant practices of socialization with children. Contacts with the country of origin are now more frequent and result in more immigrant families being influenced to maintain cultural patterns from the homeland and to attempt to influence their children to keep them. Unit 7. Number 1. In one experiment, subjects observed a person solve 30 multiple choice problems. In all cases, 15 of the problems were solved correctly. One group of subjects saw the person solve more problems correctly in the first half, and another group saw the person solve more problems correctly in the second half. The group that saw the person perform better on the initial examples rated the person as more intelligent and recalled that he had solved more problems correctly. The explanation for the difference is that one group formed the opinion that the person was intelligent on the initial set of data, while the other group formed the opposite opinion. Once this opinion is formed, When opposing evidence is presented, it can be discounted by attributing later performance to some other cause, such as chance or problem difficulty. Number 2. An interesting study about facial expressions was recently published by the American Psychological Association. Fifteen Chinese people and fifteen Scottish people took part in the study. They viewed emotion neutral faces that were randomly changed on a computer screen and then categorized the facial expressions as happy, sad, surprised, fearful, or angry. The responses allowed researchers to identify the expressive facial features that participants associated with each emotion. The study found that the Chinese participants relied more on the eyes to tell facial expressions. While the Scottish participants relied on the eyebrows and mouth. People from different cultures perceive happy, sad, or angry facial expressions in different ways. That is, facial expressions are not the universal language of emotions. Number three. Several studies have found that pet owners have lower blood pressure. A reduced risk of heart disease and lower levels of stress. Pets can also be a plus in the workplace. A study found that in the course of workday, stress levels decreased for workers who brought in their dogs. The differences in perceived stress between days the dog was present and absent were significant. The employees as a whole had a higher job satisfaction than industry norms. Having a dog in the office had a positive effect on the general atmosphere, relieving stress and making everyone around happier. Pet presence may serve as a low cost wellness solution, readily available to many organizations. Number four. Some researchers investigated the effects of different media on children's ability to produce imaginative responses. In one study, 
Children in grades one through four were separated randomly into two groups and presented with the same fictional story. One group listened to the story via radio, while the other group watched the story on a television. Afterward, all of the children were asked what they thought would happen next in the story. The researchers rated children's imaginativeness by recording the novel elements, such as characters, setting, dialogue, and feelings they used in their responses. The children who listened to the radio produced more imaginative responses, whereas the children who watched the television produced more words that repeated the original story. Media scholars have used this study to illustrate the visualization hypothesis, which states that children's exposure to ready-made visual images restricts their ability to generate novel images of their own. Exercise number one. Some years ago, a psychologist named Richard Leapup called a group of introverts to his lab and asked them to act like extroverts while pretending to teach a math class. Then he and his team, with video cameras in hand, measured the length of their strides, the amount of eye contact they made with their students, the percentage of time they spent talking, and the volume of their speech. They also rated how generally extroverted those fake extroverts appeared, based on their recorded voices and body language. Then Lipa did the same thing with actual extroverts and compared the results. He found that although the latter group came across as more extroverted, some of the fake extroverts were surprisingly convincing. It seems that most of us know how to fake it to some extent. Whether or not we're aware that the length of our strides and the amount of time we spend talking and smiling mark us as introverts and extroverts, we know it unconsciously. Exercise number two. Consumers like a bottle of wine more if they are told it cost ninety dollars a bottle than if they are told it cost ten. Belief that the wine is more expensive turns on the neurons in the medial orbitofrontal cortex, an area of the brain associated with pleasure feelings. Wine without a price tag doesn't have this effect. In 2008, American food and wine critics teamed up with a statistician from Yale and a couple of Swedish economists to study the result of thousands of blind tastings of wines, ranging from one dollar and sixty-five cents. To one hundred and fifty dollars a bottle. They found that when they can't see the price tag, people prefer cheaper wine to pricier bottles. Experts' tastes did move in the proper direction. They favored finer, more expensive wines, but the bias was almost imperceptible. A wine that cost ten times more than another was ranked by experts only seven points higher on a scale of one to one hundred. Unit Eight, Number One. What do advertising and map making have in common? Without doubt, the best answer is their shared need to communicate a limited version of the truth. An advertisement must create an image that's appealing, and a map must present an image that's clear. But neither can meet its goal by telling or showing everything. Ads will cover up or play down negative aspects of the company or service they advertise. In this way, they can promote a favorable comparison with similar products or differentiate a product from its competitors. Likewise, the map must remove details that would be confusing. Number two, when people expect to see someone again. They are more likely to find that person attractive, regardless of the individual's behavior, than if they do not have expectations of future interaction. The expectation of future interaction motivates people to look for positive qualities in someone, so that they will look forward to future interactions rather than dread them, and increases the chances 
that people will find the individual attractive. Conversely, when people interact with someone whom they do not foresee meeting again, they have little reason to search for positive qualities. In fact, doing so may be depressing, given that they may not have the opportunity to get to know the person better in future interactions. Indeed, people are sometimes motivated to find negative qualities in individuals whom they do not expect to see again. Number three. By likening the eye to a camera, elementary biology textbooks help to produce a misleading impression of what perception entails. Only in terms of the physics of image formation do the eye and camera have anything in common. Both eye and camera have a lens that focuses light rays from the outside world into an image, and both have a means of adjusting the focus and brightness of that image. Both eye and camera have a light sensitive layer onto which the image is cast, the retina and film, respectively. However, image formation is only the first step towards seeing. Superficial analogies between the eye and a camera obscure the much more fundamental difference between the two, which is that the camera merely records an image, whereas the visual system interprets it. Number four. Errors and failures typically corrupt all human designs. Indeed, the failure of a single component of your car's engine could force you to call for a tow truck. Similarly, a tiny wiring error in your computer's circuits can mean throwing the whole computer out. Natural systems are different, though. Throughout Earth's history, An estimated 3 million to 100 million species have disappeared, which means that this year somewhere between 3 and 100 species will vanish. However, such natural extinctions appear to cause little harm. Over millions of years, the ecosystem has developed an amazing insensitivity to errors and failures, surviving even such drastic events as the impact of the Yucatan meteorite, which killed tens of thousands of species. Exercise number one. The movie industry is obviously affected by personal recommendations. Even though well over a billion dollars is spent every year on promoting new movies, people talking to people is what really counts. According to Marvin Antonowski, head of marketing for Universal Pictures, word of mouth is like wildfire. This point is well illustrated by the number of low budget movies. That have succeeded with little or no advertising, and by the number of big budget flops. Like the movies, book publishing is another industry where lots of money is traditionally spent on advertising, but can't begin to compete with the power of friends telling friends about their discoveries. 25 years ago, The Road Less Traveled by psychiatrist M. Scott Peck was just another psychology relationship book. Lying unnoticed on bookstore shelves. Then a few people read it, told their friends, and started a chain reaction that is still going on. Today, there are well over two million copies in print. Exercise number two. There are two types of managers in business organizations: functional managers and project managers. Both types of managers have different roles and qualities. Functional managers head one of a firm's departments, such as marketing or engineering, and they are specialists in the area they manage. They are skilled at breaking the components of a system into smaller elements, knowing something of the details of each operation for which they are responsible. On the other hand. Project managers begin their career as specialists in some field. When promoted to the position of project manager, they must transform from technical caterpillar to generalist butterfly. They oversee many functional areas, each with its own specialists. Therefore, 
What is required is an ability to put many pieces of a task together to form a coherent whole. Thus, to understand a frog, for example, functional managers cut it open to examine it, but project managers watch it swim with other frogs and consider the environment. Unit 9. Number 1. Why do we need to routinely have the oil changed in our automobiles? Why do we need to see our dentist twice a year? The simple answer to these questions is preventative maintenance. How many times have you heard of stories where people ignored the warning signs and adverse situations seemed to present themselves overnight? A friend of mine knew there was a nail in one of his front tires, but there didn't seem to be any obvious damage to the tire. He chose to ignore the nail until he found himself on the side of the highway with a flat tire. He later told me that before he experienced the embarrassment of having a flat, he planned on getting it fixed when he had the time. If he would have only taken a few minutes to get the nail removed, he most likely would not have received a flat tire on that particular day. Number 2. How can we access the nutrients we need with less impact on the environment? The most significant component of agriculture that contributes to climate change is livestock. Globally, beef cattle and milk cattle have the most significant impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, GHGEs, and are responsible for 41% of the world's CO2 emissions and 20% of the total global GHGEs. The atmospheric increases in GHGEs caused by the transport, land clearance, methane emissions, and grain cultivation associated with the livestock industry are the main drivers behind increases in global temperatures. In contrast to conventional livestock, insects as mini livestock are low GHGE emitters, use minimal land, can be fed on food waste rather than cultivated grain, and can be farmed anywhere, thus potentially also avoiding GHGEs caused by long-distance transportation. If we increased insect consumption and decreased meat consumption worldwide, the global warming potential of the food system would be significantly reduced. Number 3. Have you ever wondered why a dog doesn't fall over when he changes directions while running? When a dog is running and has to turn quickly, he throws the front paw of his body in the direction he wants to go. His back then bends, but his hind part will still continue in the original direction. Naturally, this turning movement might result in the dog's hind part swinging wide. And this could greatly slow his rate of movement or even cause the dog to fall over as he tries to make a high-speed turn. However, the dog's tail helps to prevent this. Throwing his tail in the same direction that his body is turning serves to reduce the tendency to spin off course. Number 4. How funny are you? While some people are natural humorists, being funny is a set of skills that can be learned. Exceptionally funny people don't depend upon their memory to keep track of everything they find funny. In the olden days, great comedians carried notebooks to write down funny thoughts or observations and scrapbooks for news clippings that struck them as funny. Today, you can do that easily with your smartphone. If you have a funny thought, record it as an audio note. If you read a funny article, save the link in your bookmarks. The world is a funny place, and your existence within it is probably funnier. Accepting that fact is a blessing that gives you everything you need to see humor and craft stories on a daily basis. All you have to do is document them and then tell someone.
Exercise number one. When we hear a story, we look for beliefs that are being commented upon. Any story has many possible beliefs inherent in it. But how does someone listening to a story find those beliefs? We find them by looking through the beliefs we already have. We are not as concerned with what we are hearing as we are with finding what we already know that is relevant. Picture it in this way. As understanders, we have a list of beliefs indexed by subject area. When a new story appears, we attempt to find a belief of ours that relates to it. When we do, we find a story attached to that belief and compare the story in our memory to the one we are processing. Our understanding of the new story becomes, at that point, a function of the old story. Once we find a belief and connected story, we need no further processing. That is, the search for other beliefs stops. Exercise number two. You know the old saying about having only one chance to make a first impression? Forget about it for once and give people a second chance. Even if you didn't like someone's question at yesterday's lecture or you thought his outfit was out of place for the event, don't immediately write that person off as a potential friend. This is a time in your life to dig deeper and allow yourself to find out what makes people behave the way they do. Forget about surfaces and look for what's inside. And remember, it takes time for new friendships to develop. As you get to know each other, Shared experiences and interests will become woven into the friendship. Keep working on the relationship, even if it feels uncomfortable at times. Unit 10. Number 1. Jason always seemed to have a tough time in classes, except in the ones where he could do something. In the classes in which the teachers just stood and talked, or told everyone to read, he seemed to get bored and restless. But the ones in which he could get up and do things, like industrial arts, drama, science projects, or PE, were always his favorites. He soon realized that he was not a slow or unmotivated learner. He was a kinesthetic learner. Once he figured this out, he started to use this information to his advantage. He would draw out what he learned from class on notes, posters, and doodles. He would act out things and work with other students on projects using role play and drama. This helped his learning come alive, and he was less bored. As a result, he not only enjoyed school more, but his grades also went up. Number 2. Ignorance about the African continent has led to some enormous errors in map-making. One of the errors happened in the 1700s when a European explorer reported having seen mountains in southern Mali. From that report, a map-maker drew in a long line of mountains. As a result, these Kong Mountains, as he called them, were drawn on almost all maps of Africa in the 19th century, and they seemed to be an important feature of the continental geography. European politicians and traders made decisions based on their belief in the existence of these mountains. However, in the late 1880s, a French explorer proved that there were no mountains in that part of Africa. Following that discovery, the Kong Mountains disappeared from maps of Africa. Number 3. What story could be harsher than that of the great auk, the large black and white seabird that in northern oceans took the ecological place of a penguin? Its tail rises and falls like a Greek tragedy, with island populations savagely destroyed by humans until almost all were gone. Then, 
the very last colony found safety on a special island, one protected from the destruction of humankind by vicious and unpredictable ocean currents. These waters presented no problem to perfectly adapted seagoing birds, but they prevented humans from making any kind of safe landing. After enjoying a few years of comparative safety, disaster of a different kind struck the Great Auk. Volcanic activity caused the island refuge to sink completely beneath the waves, and surviving individuals were forced to find shelter elsewhere. The new island home they chose lacked the benefits of the old in one terrible way. Humans could access it with comparative ease, and they did. Within just a few years, the last of this once plentiful species was entirely eliminated. Number four. Wilt never needed or even wanted a high school education, but when he tried to get a part-time job after retirement, he couldn't because he didn't have a high school diploma, and that annoyed him. He set out to get his general education diploma (GED), which certifies high school level academic competence. Month after month, year after year. He took the GED tests. He'd fail them and study harder, only to fail each of them repeatedly for eight years. He had amazing persistence to have that goal and not let loose of it. Recalled his tutor, since it was such a tough road for him, Wilt is still saving the special message on his answering machine. I was your proctor for the GED exam. I just called to congratulate you. You passed both of the tests," said the voice. Exercise number one. I remember preparing to run a marathon years ago, and though I trained well for it, I was really scared that I'd get cramps, or that for some reason I wouldn't be able to finish. So, as an act of faith. I started thinking of something I'd do only if I had already successfully run the marathon. What I decided to do was write a letter to my grandmother in New York, as if the marathon had already come and gone, and I had happily completed it. I wrote her a couple of pages, excitedly telling her how easy it had been, and even making fun of myself for having worried so much the week before the race. I kept this letter with me all week and read it to myself whenever I felt nervous. On the day of the race, I ran the whole way, no cramps, no problems whatsoever, just like I'd written to my grandmother. Exercise number two. A few years ago, we purchased a brand new camper van. Not long after we bought our camper, a friend of ours asked if her family could borrow it. We were not too interested in loaning out our spotless camper, so we declined. This happened in the fall, and we stored the camper in our backyard all that winter. In the spring, my husband and I were setting it up to prepare for a trip. We were very surprised to find that we had left cookie boxes in the camper over the winter. We had moved and had a baby that previous summer and fall, and cleaning out the camper had been overlooked. That in itself would not have been so bad had it not been for the mice. Mice were attracted by the food, and they shredded all the curtains, screens, and cushions. Had we let the friend borrow the camper, she would have discovered the boxes before the mice did. Unit Eleven, Number One. One of the reasons for difficulty in achieving one's optimal weight is poor nutrient timing. When you eat is almost as important as what you eat, because the same nutrients have different effects on the body when consumed at different times. The body's energy needs change throughout the day. It's important to concentrate your food intake during those times 
when your body's energy needs are greatest, and not to consume more calories than your body needs to meet its immediate energy needs at any time. When you consume calories at times of peak energy need, most of them are used to fuel your muscles and nervous system, to synthesize muscle tissue, and to replenish muscle fuel stores. When you consume more calories than you need at any time, those excess calories will be stored as body fat. Number two, anxiety has been around for thousands of years. According to evolutionary psychologists, it is adaptive to the extent that it helped our ancestors avoid situations. In which the margin of error between life and death was slim, anxiety warned people when their lives were in danger, not only from wild tigers, cave bears, hungry hyenas, and other animals stalking the landscape, but also from hostile, competing tribes. Being on alert helped ancient people fight predators, flee from enemies, or freeze, blending in as if camouflaged. So they wouldn't be noticed. It mobilized them to react to real threats to their survival. It pushed them into keeping their children out of harm's way. Anxiety thus persisted through evolution in a majority of the population because it was and can be an advantageous life-saving trait. Number three. In most offices, the phone is constantly ringing. People are stopping by, and it is impossible to focus on one problem. I have always found it hard to be creative in a doorless office. In such an office, we cannot stare into space for a long time, pace the floor, or lie down for a few minutes. However. All of these things I do regularly when I am coming up with an idea behind closed doors. For me, and I believe for most people, the generation of ideas is closely linked to physical comfort. Allowing employees to occasionally work from home or a private space will generate better ideas and results. Number four. Dear Ms. Diane Edwards, I am a teacher working at East End High School. I have read from your notice that the East End Seaport Museum is now offering a special program, the 2017 Bug Lighthouse Experience. The program would be a great opportunity for our students to have fun and experience something new. I estimate that 50 students and teachers from our school would like to participate in it. Would you please let me know if it is possible to make a group reservation for the program for Saturday, November eighteenth? We don't want to miss this great opportunity. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Best regards, Joseph Loach. Exercise number one. The trio of freeze, flight, and fight are fairly universal behavioral defense reactions in mammals and other vertebrate species. But some species have other options available, such as playing dead, which is also called tonic immobility. Like freezing, this behavior can help prevent attack. But whereas in freezing, muscles are contracted and poised to be used in fight or flight, in tonic immobility. The muscles of the body are relaxed. Another such response is defensive burying. Rodents will use their paws and head to shovel dirt toward an aversive stimulus. Other behavioral options include making loud noises, retreating into a shell, rolling into a tight ball, choosing to live in a predator-free area such as underground, or relying on safety in numbers by living in a group. Exercise number two. Catherine Triber and Leslie Sim, experts on exercise addiction, recognized that smartwatches and fitness trackers have probably inspired sedentary people to take up exercise, 
and encouraged people who aren't very active to exercise more consistently. But they were convinced the devices were also quite dangerous. Schreiber explained that focusing on numbers separates people from being in tune with their body. Exercising becomes mindless, which is the goal of addiction. This goal that she mentioned is a sort of automatic mindlessness, the outsourcing of decision making to a device. She recently sustained a stress fracture in her foot because she refused to listen to her overworked body, instead, continuing to run toward an unreasonable workout target. Schreiber has suffered from addictive exercise tendencies and vows not to use wearable tech when she works out. Exercise number three. An experiment was conducted using a diverse set of behavioral measures to determine whether the use of dietary supplements such as vitamins, minerals, or amino acids would influence subsequent health-related behaviors. Participants in Group A were instructed to take a multivitamin, and participants in the control group were assigned to take a placebo. However, all the participants actually took placebo pills. The result from the experiment demonstrated that participants who believed they had taken dietary supplements felt safe from health problems, thus leading them to engage in health risk behaviors. To put it simply, people who take dietary supplements may make poor decisions when it comes to their health, such as choosing fast food over a healthy and organic meal. Exercise number four. Dear Mr. Stevens, this is the chief editor of Novel Flash Fiction. As you were informed by our staff last week, your short story will be published in the December issue of Novel Flash Fiction. We thought hearing how you came up with your story would be meaningful to our readers. We would thus like to ask you if you could give a speech about your writing process. This speech is expected to last for about an hour, and it will take place at Star Bookstore downtown. You can choose a specific date and time depending on your schedule. If you have any questions, please contact us by email at editors at nff dot com. We look forward to hearing how you wrote your story. Sincerely, Susanna Martinez. Unit Twelve, Number One. On his march through Asia Minor, Alexander the Great fell dangerously ill. His physicians were afraid to treat him because if they didn't succeed, the army would blame them. Only one, Philip, was willing to take the risk, as he had confidence in the king's friendship and his own drugs. While the medicine was being prepared. Alexander received a letter accusing the physician of having been bribed to poison his master. Alexander read the letter without showing it to anyone. When Philip entered the tent with the medicine, Alexander took the cup from him, handing Philip the letter. While the physician was reading it, Alexander calmly drank the contents of the cup. Horrified. Philip threw himself down at the king's bedside, but Alexander assured him that he had complete confidence in his honor. After three days, the king was well enough to appear again before his army. Number two. Dad just laughed and walked out of the room, still holding Slade in his arms. He had dressed him. And now he put him in his chair. As Slade sat in his chair eating a biscuit that Dad had spread with butter and homemade strawberry jam, Mom walked into the kitchen. She took one look at her little boy and started laughing. His little face and hands were covered with biscuit and jam. She thought how really cute he was. Honey, what have you done? Look at him. I will never get him clean again. I guess when he gets through eating, 
you can take him out and dump him in the bathtub. Dad laughed. Slade giggled and tried to spit biscuit all over Dad. It didn't hit him because luckily he avoided the spray. That made Mom laugh even more, and soon the little cabin was full of love and laughter. Number three. The wind continued to blow harder. He couldn't measure it by any conscious process, but he knew somehow that it was blowing harder. Not far away, a tree was uprooted. Other trees were falling, spinning and crisscrossing like matches. He was amazed at the power of the wind. The tree he was holding onto was swaying dangerously. Nearby, a woman was wailing and clutching a little girl, who in turn hung on to her cat. The sea washed across the strip of sand. He saw the silhouettes of people huddled together against the churning white of the lagoon. Things were getting worse every second. Number four. The start of the boat tour was far from what I had expected. None of the wildlife I saw was exotic. I could only see dull gray rocks. It was also so hot and humid that I could not enjoy the tour fully. However, as the boat slid into the Bay Park Canal, all of a sudden my mother shouted, "Look at the mangroves!" A whole new world came into sight. The mangrove forest alongside the canal thrilled me as we entered its cool shade. I was fascinated by the beautiful leaves and flowers of the mangroves, but best of all, I was charmed by the native birds, monkeys, and lizards moving among the branches. What a wonderful adventure! I exclaimed. Exercise number one. John was once in the office of a manager, Michael, when the phone rang. Immediately, Michael bellowed, "That disgusting phone never stops ringing!" He then proceeded to pick it up and engage in a fifteen-minute conversation while John waited. When he finally hung up, he looked exhausted and frustrated. He apologized as the phone rang once again. He later confessed that he was having a great deal of trouble completing his tasks because of the volume of calls he was responding to. At some point, John asked him, "Have you ever considered having a certain period of time when you simply don't answer the phone?" Michael said, "As a matter of fact, no." Looking at him with a puzzled look. It turned out that this simple suggestion helped Michael not only to relax. But to get more work done as well, like many people, he didn't need hours of uninterrupted time, but he did need some. Exercise number two. Doctor Paul Odland and his friend Bob travel frequently to South America, where they provide free medical treatment for disabled children of poor families. One day. They went to a local marketplace. Paul wanted to buy some souvenirs, and he spotted a carving that he liked. The non-English speaking seller was asking five hundred pesos for the carving. With Bob acting as interpreter, Paul offered three hundred, and his opponent proposed four hundred and fifty. The bargaining in the noisy market became spirited, even intense. With Paul stepping up his price slightly, and the seller going down slowly, the pace increased so fast that Bob could not keep up with the back and forth interpretation. Meanwhile, observing the seller carefully, Paul sensed something wrong in Bob's interpretation. In fact, the seller had gone below Paul's last offer. When Paul raised his doubt. Bob instantly recognized the error and corrected his interpretation. At length, they settled the deal, and he was delighted to purchase the carving at a reasonable price and thanked Bob.
Exercise number three. After dinner, he built a fire, going out into the weather for wood he had piled against the garage. The air was bright and cold against his face, and the snow in the driveway was already halfway to his knees. He gathered logs, shaking off their soft white caps and carrying them inside. He sat for a time in front of the fireplace, cross-legged, adding logs and gazing at the warm fire. Outside, snow continued to fall quietly in the cones of light cast by the streetlights. By the time he rose and looked out the window, his car had become a soft white hill on the edge of the street. Exercise number four. When she heard the dogs barking fiercely on the floor just above her, she trembled uncontrollably for fear of being caught. Drops of cold sweat rolled down her back. Before slipping into the hold of the boat, she had scattered powder, which Swedish scientists had developed unnoticeably on the floor above, in order to distract the dogs. But she knew that these dogs were so well trained that they could smell her, even though a load of fish had been dumped over her hiding place. She held her hands together tightly and tried not to make any noise. She was not sure how long she could stay like that. To her relief, it wasn't long before a whistle called the dogs out, leaving her unfound. She relaxed her hands and exhaled a deep breath. She felt safe now. Unit thirteen, number one. The first commercial train service began operating between Liverpool and Manchester in 1830. Ten years later, the first train timetable was issued. The trains were much faster than the old carriages. So the peculiar differences in local hours became a severe nuisance. In 1847, British train companies put their heads together and agreed that henceforth all train timetables would be adjusted to Greenwich Observatory time, rather than the local times of Liverpool, Manchester, or Glasgow. More and more institutions followed the lead of the train companies. Railways faced infrastructure-related challenges, such as those related to stations, tracks, and other facilities. Finally, in 1880, the British government took the unprecedented step of legislating that all timetables in Britain must follow Greenwich. For the first time in history, a country adopted a national time and obliged its population to live according to an artificial clock. Rather than local ones or sunrise to sunset cycles. Number two. Why eat a cookie? Some reasons might be to satisfy your hunger, to increase your sugar level, or just to have something to chew on. However, recent success in the packaged cookie market suggests that these may not be the only. Or perhaps even the most important reasons. It appears that cookie-producing companies are becoming aware of some other influences, and as a result, are delivering to the market products resulting from their awareness. These relatively new product offerings are usually referred to as soft or chewy cookies to distinguish them from the more typical crunchy varieties. Why all the fuss over their introduction? Apparently, much of their appeal has to do with childhood memories of sitting on the back steps, devouring those melt-in-your-mouth cookies that were delivered by mom straight from the oven while they were still soft. This emotional and sensory appeal of soft cookies is apparently at least as strong as are the physical cravings that the product satisfies. Number three. Imagine that you are dining with some people you have just met. You reach for the salt shaker, but suddenly one of the other guests 
let's call him Joe, looks at you sullenly, then snatches the salt away and puts it out of your reach. Later, when you are leaving the restaurant, Joe dashes ahead of you and blocks the exit door from the outside. Joe is being rude. When you understand what another person is trying to do, it is offensive, or at least confrontational, to prevent that person from doing it. However, if you were meeting the same people to play a board game, it would be completely acceptable for the same Joe to prevent you from winning the game. In the restaurant as well as in the game, Joe is aware of your intention, and Joe prevents you from doing what you are trying to do. At the restaurant, this is rude. In the game just mentioned, this is expected and acceptable behavior. Apparently, games give us a license to engage in conflicts to prevent others from achieving their goals. Number four. Interestingly, being observed has two quite distinct effects on performance. In some cases, performance is decreased, even to the point of non existence. The extreme of this is stage fright, the sudden fear of public performance. There are many instances of well known actors who, in mid career, develop stage fright and simply cannot perform. The other extreme is that being observed enhances performance, people doing whatever it might be better when they know that others are watching. The general rule seems to be that if one is doing something new or for the first time, then being observed while doing it decreases performance. On the other hand, being observed while doing some task or engaging in some activity that is well known or well practiced. Tends to enhance performance. So, if you are learning to play a new sport, it is better to begin it alone. But when you become skilled at it, then you will probably perform better with an audience. Exercise number one Identity theft can take many forms in the digital world. That's because many of the traditional clues about identity, someone's physical appearance and presence, are replaced by machine based checking of credentials. Someone is able to acquire your credentials, sign on names, passwords, cards, tokens, and in so doing is able to convince an electronic system that they are you. This is an ingredient in large numbers of cyber related fraud. And cyber related fraud is by far the most common form of crime that hits individuals. Thanks to advances in cybersecurity systems, reports of this crime have lowered dramatically. For example, identity thieves can buy goods and services which you will never see but will pay for, intercept payments, and, more drastically, empty your bank account. Although the victims of identity theft are usually thought of as individuals, small and large businesses are often caught out as well. Exercise number two Your personality and sense of responsibility affect not only your relationships with others, your job, and your hobbies. But also your learning abilities and style. Some people are very self driven. They are more likely to be lifelong learners. Many tend to be independent learners and do not require structured classes with instructors to guide them. Other individuals are peer oriented and often follow the lead of another in unfamiliar situations. They are more likely to benefit from the assistance of a formal teaching environment. They may be less likely to pursue learning throughout life without direct access to formal learning scenarios or the influence of a friend or spouse. Exercise number three People treat children in a variety of ways care for them, punish them, love them. Neglect them, teach them. 
If parents, relatives, and other agents of socialization perceive a child as smart, they will act toward him or her that way. Thus, the child eventually comes to believe he or she is a smart person. One of the earliest symbolic interactionists, Charles Horton Cooley, argued that we use the reaction of others toward us as mirrors in which we see ourselves and determine our self worth. Through this process, we imagine how we might look to other people, we interpret their responses to us, and we form a self concept. If we think people perceive us favorably, we're likely to develop a positive self concept. Conversely, if we detect unfavorable reactions, our self concept will likely be negative. Hence, Self evaluative feelings such as pride or shame are always the product of the reflected appraisals of others. Exercise number four. Most consumer magazines depend on subscriptions and advertising. Subscriptions account for almost 90% of total magazine circulation. Single copy or newsstand sales account for the rest. However, single copy sales are important. They bring in more revenue per magazine because subscription prices are typically at least 50% less than the price of buying single issues. Further, potential readers explore a new magazine by buying a single issue. All those insert cards with subscription offers are included in magazines to encourage you to subscribe. Some magazines are distributed only by subscription. Professional or trade magazines are specialized magazines and are often published by professional associations. They usually feature highly targeted advertising. For example, the Columbia Journalism Review. Is marketed toward professional journalists, and its few advertisements are news organizations, book publishers, and others. A few magazines, like Consumer Reports, work toward objectivity and therefore contain no advertising. Unit 14. Number 1. Judgments about flavor are often influenced by predictions based on the appearance of the food. For example, strawberry flavored foods would be expected to be red. However, if colored green, because of the association of green foods with flavors such as lime, it would be difficult to identify the flavor as strawberry unless it was very strong. Color intensity also affects flavor perception. A stronger color may cause perception of a stronger flavor in a product, even if the stronger color is simply due to the addition of more food coloring. Texture also can be misleading. A thicker product may be perceived as tasting richer or stronger simply because it is thicker, and not because the thickening agent affects the flavor of the food. Number two. Some of the most extensive research on the subject of success was conducted by George and Alec Gallup. They interviewed people acknowledged as successful in a wide variety of areas business, science, literature, education, religion, etc. The goal of the researchers was to determine what these high achieving people had in common. There was one thing they all had in common the willingness to work long, hard hours. All of them agreed that success wasn't something that had just happened to them due to luck or special talents. It happened because they'd made it happen through continuous effort. Instead of looking for shortcuts and ways to avoid hard work, these people welcomed it as a necessary part of the process. Number three. Houston Airport executives faced plenty of complaints regarding baggage claim time, so they increased the number of baggage handlers. Although it reduced the average wait time to eight minutes, 
complaints didn't stop. It took about a minute to get from the arrival gate to baggage claim, so the passengers spent seven more minutes waiting for their bags. The solution was to move the arrival gates away from the baggage claim, so it took passengers about seven minutes to walk there. It resulted in complaints reducing to almost zero. Research shows occupied time feels shorter than unoccupied time. People usually exaggerate about the time they waited, and what they find most bothersome is time spent unoccupied. Thus, occupying the passengers' time by making them walk longer gave them the idea they didn't have to wait as long. Number four. When you are anxious, the perceived threat potential of stimuli related to your anxiety can rise. Thus, things you typically encounter that might not usually trigger fear now do so. For example, if you encounter a snake in the course of a hike, even if no harm comes, anxiety is likely aroused, putting you on alert. If farther along the trail you notice a dark, slender, curved branch on the ground, an object you would normally ignore, you might now momentarily be likely to view it as a snake, triggering a feeling of fear. Similarly, if you live in a place where terror alerts are common, harmless stimuli can become potential threats. In New York City, when the alert level rises. A parcel or paper bag left under an empty subway seat can trigger much concern. Number five. Most people think their conscious minds control everything they do. They generally believe the conscious mind constantly directs their actions. These beliefs are false. Consider walking, for example. Which is something that most people do over and over all day long. Do you consciously control the movements of your legs and feet? Does your conscious mind have to say, "Now pick up the left foot, swing it forward, hold it high enough so it doesn't touch the ground, set down the heel, roll forward, shift weight off the back foot, and so on"? Of course not. Most of the time. Walking is done without conscious thoughts or intentions. Exercise number one. It is not hard to see that a strong economy, where opportunities are plentiful and jobs go begging, helps break down social barriers. Biased employers may still dislike hiring members of one group or another, but when nobody else is available. Discrimination most often gives way to the basic need to get the work done. The same goes for employees with prejudices about whom they do and do not like working alongside. In the American construction boom of the late 1990s, for example, even the carpenters' union, long known as a traditional bastion of white men, a world where a coveted union card was handed down from father to son, began openly encouraging women. Blacks and Hispanics to join its internship program. At least in the workplace, jobs chasing people obviously does more to promote a fluid society than people chasing jobs. Exercise number two. In a classic experiment from 1972, participants were divided into two groups. The members of the first group were told that they would receive a small electric shock. In the second group, subjects were told that the risk of this happening was only 50 percent. The researchers measured physical anxiety, heart rate, nervousness, sweating, etc., shortly before starting. The result was well shocking. There was absolutely no difference. Participants in both groups were equally stressed. Next, the researchers announced a series of reductions in the probability of a shock for the second group, from 50 percent to 20 percent, then 10 percent, then 5 percent. The result: still no difference. However, 
when they declared they would increase the strength of the expected current, both groups' anxiety levels rose, again by the same degree. This illustrates that we respond to the expected magnitude of an event, but not to its likelihood. Exercise number three. New media can be defined by four characteristics simultaneously. They are media at the turn of the 20th and 21st centuries, which are both integrated and interactive, and use digital code and hypertext as technical means. It follows that their most common alternative names are multimedia, interactive media, and digital media. By using this definition, it is easy to identify media as old or new. For example, traditional television is integrated as it contains images, sound, and text, but it is not interactive or based on digital code. The plain old telephone was interactive, but not integrated, as it only transmitted speech and sounds, and it did not work with digital code. In contrast, the new medium of interactive television. Adds interactivity and digital code. Additionally, the new generations of mobile or fixed telephony are fully digitized and integrated, as they add text, pictures, or video, and they are connected to the internet. Exercise number four. In two thousand six, researchers at the University of Missouri took twenty eight undergraduates. And ask them to memorize lists of words, and then recall these words at a later time. To test whether distraction affected their ability to memorize, the researchers asked the students to perform a simultaneous task, placing a series of letters in order based on their color by pressing the keys on a computer keyboard. This task was given under two conditions: when the students were memorizing the lists of words. And when the students were recalling those lists for the researchers, the Missouri scientists discovered that concurrent tasks affected both memorizing and recalling. When the keyboard task was given while the students were trying to recall the previously memorized words, there was a nine to twenty-six percent decline in their performance. The decline was even more if the concurrent task occurred while they were memorizing. In which case their performance decreased by forty-six to fifty-nine percent. Unit fifteen. Number one. Thomas Nast was born on September twenty-seventh, eighteen forty, in Landau, Germany, and moved with his mother and sister to New York in eighteen forty-six. Young Nast was a poor student. He never learned to read or write. But showed an early talent for drawing. When he was about thirteen years old, he quit regular school, and the next year he studied art with Theodor Kaufmann, a photographer and painter. In 1862, he joined the staff of Harper's Weekly, where he focused his efforts on political cartoons. Nast made lasting contributions to the American political and cultural scene. He created the elephant as the symbol for the Republican Party, and the modern version of Santa Claus. He also played an important role in the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Number two, the brown tree snake has a large head with sticking out eyes. The head is distinct from the narrow neck. Its body usually has a light brown background with a series of darker markings or bands on it. The snake is about thirty-eight centimeters when it comes out of its egg, and usually reaches one to two meters long. This snake is infamous for causing the extinction of the majority of native bird species in Guam. Shortly after World War II, the brown tree snake was accidentally brought into Guam. From its native range in the South Pacific, probably as an unwanted passenger on a ship or plane, it is not hunted or eaten by any other animals in Guam, 
and is therefore at the top of its food chain, which has led the snake to increase dramatically in number. Number three. Painters have, in principle, an infinite range of colors at their disposal, especially in modern times, with the chromatic explosion of synthetic chemistry. And yet, painters don't use all the colors at once, and indeed, many have used a remarkably restrictive selection. Mondrian limited himself mostly to the three primaries red, yellow, and blue to fill his black ruled grids. And Casimir Melevich worked with similar self imposed restrictions. For Eves Klein, one color was enough. Franz Klein's art was typically black on white. There was nothing new in this. The Greeks and Romans tended to use just red, yellow, black, and white. Why? It's impossible to generalize, but both in antiquity and modernity, It seems likely that the expanded palette aided clarity and comprehensibility, and helped to focus attention on the components that mattered: shape and form. Number four. Even if lying doesn't have any harmful effects in a particular case, it is still morally wrong because, if discovered, lying weakens the general practice of truth-telling. On which human communication relies. For instance, if I were to lie about my age on grounds of vanity, and my lying were discovered, even though no serious harm would have been done, I would have undermined your trust generally. In that case, you would be far less likely to believe anything I might say in the future. Thus, all lying, when discovered, has indirect harmful effects. However. Very occasionally, these harmful effects might possibly be outweighed by the benefits which arise from a lie. For example, if someone is seriously ill, lying to them about their life expectancy might probably give them a chance of living longer. On the other hand, telling them the truth could possibly induce a depression that would accelerate their physical decline. Exercise number one. James Van Der Zee was born on June twenty ninth, eighteen eighty six, in Lenox, Massachusetts. The second of six children, James grew up in a family of creative people. At the age of fourteen, he received his first camera and took hundreds of photographs of his family and town. By nineteen o six, he had moved to New York, married. And was taking jobs to support his growing family. In 1907, he moved to Fotis, Virginia, where he worked in the dining room of the Hotel Chamberlain. During this time, he also worked as a photographer on a part-time basis. He opened his own studio in 1916. World War One had begun, and many young soldiers came to the studio to have their pictures taken. In 1969, the exhibition "Harlem on My Mind" brought him international recognition. He died in 1983. Exercise number two: The saula, also known as the Vu Quang ox, is an endangered nocturnal forest-dwelling ox weighing about 100 kilograms. Its habitat is the dense mountain forests in the Annamite Mountains, which run through the Lao PDR and Vietnam. The saula is generally considered the greatest animal discovery of recent times. First documented in Vietnam in 1992, it is so different from any other known species that a separate genus had to be created for it. The saula stays at higher elevations during the wetter summer season, when streams at these altitudes have plenty of water, and moves down to the lowlands in winter, when the mountain streams dry up. They are said to travel mostly in groups of two or three animals. Hunting and the loss of forest habitat due to logging and conversion to farmland 
threaten its survival. Exercise number three. Most people are confident that creativity is an individual possession, not a collective phenomenon. Despite some notable collaborations in the arts and sciences, the most impressive acts of creative thought, from Archimedes to Jane Austen, appear to have been the products of individuals, and often isolated and eccentric individuals who reject commonly held beliefs. I think that this perception is something of an illusion. However, it cannot be denied that the primary source of novelty lies in the recombination of information within the individual brain. But I suspect that as individuals, we would and could accomplish little in the way of creative thinking outside the context of the superbrain, the integration of individual brains. The heads of Archimedes, Jane Austen. And all the other original thinkers who stretch back into the Middle Stone Age in Africa were disconnected with the thoughts of others from early childhood onward, including the ideas of those long dead or unknown. How could they have created without the collective constructions of mathematics, language, and art? Exercise number four. Although children watch television at various times, the programming that they view alone tends to be specifically aimed at children. In the United States, particularly, most of the advertising during this segment consists of ads for food, particularly sugared food. During the run-up to Christmas, increasing numbers of ads concern toys and games. Such practices are believed to put pressure on parents. To yield to what the media have dubbed "pester power," this has led to calls for legislation to regulate advertising in Europe and the United States. Indeed, the Swedish government has outlawed television advertising of products aimed at children under 12, and recently in the United States, 50 psychologists signed a petition calling for a ban on the advertising of children's goods. Unit sixteen, number one, sixteenth Springvale Book Festival, Saturday, June fourth, ten a.m. to five p.m., Springvale Public Library, four five three six Main Street, Springvale, Wisconsin. Mark your calendar for the sixteenth Springvale Book Festival. This is your big chance to meet the nation's best authors. And discuss their works. Authors will be speaking at the main hall on the second floor from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Note: Authors will be signing books in the lobby, so please bring your own personal copies, or you can purchase books on site. Get the most out of your big day by downloading the festival app at our website www.spvbf.org. It features a complete list of all events and locations, maps, and ways to share it all via social media. All programs will be free of charge. Please visit our website for more information about the festival. Number two, poetry in the park, Saturday, October thirteenth, eleven a.m. to six p.m. This annual festival, now in its sixth year, is held with the support of Riverside Public Library. Poetry workshop. Meet and talk with renowned poets about their poems. Jane Kenny, eleven thirty a.m. Michael Wheel, twelve thirty p.m. Learn how to express your feelings poetically. Poetry contest. Theme for this year's contest is arrivals and departures. Only one poem per participant. Due by 3 p.m. The winners will be announced at 5 p.m. on the day on site. For questions about the festival, please visit our website at www.poetryinthepark.org.
Number three. Smartphone average prices. The above graph shows the smartphone average prices in China and India between 2010 and 2015, compared with the global smartphone average price during the same period. The global smartphone average price decreased from 2010 to 2015, but still stayed the highest among the three. The smartphone average price in China dropped between 2010 and 2013. The smartphone average price in India reached its peak in 2011. From 2013, China and India took opposite paths. With China's smartphone average price going down and India's going up, the gap between the global smartphone average price and the smartphone average price in China was the smallest in 2015. Number four, life expectancy at birth in 2030 for five selected countries. The table above displays the life expectancy at birth in 2030 for five selected countries. In each of the five selected countries, it is predicted that the life expectancy of women will be higher than that of men. In the case of women, life expectancy in the Republic of Korea is expected to be the highest among the five countries, followed by that in Austria. As for men. The Republic of Korea and Singapore will rank the first and the second highest, respectively, in life expectancy in the five countries. Both Slovakian women and men will have the lowest life expectancy by gender among the five countries, with 82.92 and 76.98 years, respectively. Among the five countries, the largest difference in life expectancy between women and men. Is 6.75 years, predicted to be found in the Republic of Korea, and the smallest difference is 3.46 years in Sweden. Exercise number one: Wireless charging pad. Instructions: Wireless smartphone charging. One. Connect the charging pad to a power source. Two. Place your smartphone on the charging pad with the display facing up. Three. Place your smartphone on the center of the charging pad, or it will not charge. Charge status LED. Blue light. Your smartphone is charging. If there's a problem, the blue light will flash. White light. Your smartphone is fully charged. Caution: Do not place anything between your smartphone and the charging pad while charging. The charging pad is not water resistant. Keep it dry. Exercise number two: Name our sports center. The grand opening of our brand new sports center is on November 30th, but we still don't have a name. Please take this opportunity to be part of Watford Community History and help us name it. Entry submission: September 1st through 30th on our website www.watfordcc.org. The three best entries will be selected by the Watford Volunteer Group. And will be made available online for voting to decide the winner. Vote, October fifteenth through thirty-first on our website. Winner announcement, November third on our website. Prize, a one-year Sports Center membership. We're looking for the most dynamic and fun names, so get your entries in now. Watford Community Council. Exercise number three: Accuracy or trustworthiness of the information found using search engines. 
The two pie charts above show how much of the information found using search engines is considered to be accurate or trustworthy by two groups of respondents, AP and NWP teachers and U.S. adult search users in 2012. As for AP and NWP teachers, 5% say that all, almost all, of the information found using search engines is accurate or trustworthy, while 28% of U.S. adult search users say the same. The largest percentage of both AP and NWP teachers and U.S. adult search users answer that most of the information is accurate or trustworthy. In addition, 40% of AP and NWP teachers say that some of the information is accurate or trustworthy, and more than 30% of U.S. adult search users respond the same. U.S. adult search users saying that very little, none of the information found using search engines is accurate or trustworthy account for less than 5%. The percentage of U.S. adult search users who answer don't know is only 1%. Exercise number four. Top 10 origin countries of international students. The tables above show the top 10 origin countries and the number of international students enrolled in U.S. colleges and universities in two school years. 1979 to 1980 and 2016 to 2017. The total number of international students in 2016 to 2017 was over three times larger than the total number of international students in 1979 to 1980. Iran, Taiwan, and Nigeria were the top three origin countries of international students in 1979 to 1980 among which only Taiwan was included in the list of the top 10 origin countries in 2016 to 2017. The number of students from India was over 20 times larger in 2016 to 2017 than in 1979 to 1980, and India ranked higher than China in 2016 to 2017. South Korea, which was not included among the top 10 origin countries in 1979 to 1980, ranked third in 2016 to 2017. Although the number of students from Japan was larger in 2016 to 2017 than in 1979 to 1980, Japan ranked lower in 2016 to 2017 than in 1979 to 1980. Unit 17. Number 1. It isn't going to be easy making changes to the food your children eat, and even the most careful patient parents will probably find that the little ones will resist at some point and to some degree. The problem is that many of us were forced to eat in a healthy way as children. We learned the hard way. And the temptation to continue with these parental habits with our own children is strong. If you were made to sit at the table until you had cleaned your plate, you are not alone. Most of the adult population have suffered this at some point, at school if not at home. Forcing your children to eat, especially if they don't like what is on the plate, is completely counterproductive. Sit there until you finish may be how we learned and may also be the only way you feel able to achieve your goal. But think about it. The experience of eating a pile of unwanted cabbage until they feel sick is hardly going to make children jump for joy the next time it is served. This strict approach is very old-fashioned and you may win the battle, but you definitely won't win the war. Delaying puddings used to be thought of as a good idea, too, but guess what? That doesn't work either. No pudding until you have finished your main course was the standard line 
when most parents of today were young, and is still commonly used, but it only makes sweet things seem more desirable. Number two, one cannot take for granted that the findings of any given study will have validity. Consider a situation where an investigator is studying deviant behavior. In particular, she is investigating the extent to which cheating by college students occurs on exams, reasoning that it is more difficult for people monitoring an exam to keep students under surveillance in large classes than in smaller ones. She hypothesizes that a higher rate of cheating will occur on exams in large classes than in small. To test this hypothesis, she collects data on cheating in both large classes and small ones, and then analyzes the data. Her results show that more cheating per student occurs in the larger classes. Thus, the data apparently reject the investigator's research hypothesis. A few days later, however, a colleague points out that all the large classes in her study used multiple choice exams, whereas all the small classes used short answer and essay exams. The investigator immediately realizes that an extraneous variable, exam format, is interfering with the independent variable, class size, and may be operating as a cause in her data. The apparent support for her research hypothesis may be nothing more than an artifact. Perhaps the true effect is that more cheating occurs on multiple choice exams than on essay exams, regardless of class size. Number three, American gymnast Bart Connor was active in many sports as a child, starting his gymnastics career at the age of ten, and progressing quickly to become the youngest member of the United States Olympic team. At the summer games in Montreal, he attended the University of Oklahoma and worked with gymnastics coach Paul Ziert. The coach's critical opinion was that Connor had a relative lack of flexibility and limited tumbling skills. Despite the coach's negative perspective, Connor refused to accept such limitations that he pointed out. Connor's motivation, combined with his other physical abilities, Helped him to quickly advance. Connor won the parallel bars event at the World Championship with an original complex move called the Connor Spin, since he was the first ever to do it. Nine months before his country hosted the Olympics in Los Angeles, Connor tore his bicep muscle. People believed Connor would never make it back in time to compete in the Olympics. He underwent surgery and intensive physical therapy in an attempt to regain fitness. With just one chance left to qualify, he managed to squeeze into the Olympic team. Connor underwent intense training to reclaim his competitive level. By enduring this training, Connor helped the U.S. team to earn a gymnastics team gold. In his favored parallel bars event. He scored a perfect ten to win an individual gold medal as well. Afterwards, in an interview, Connor thanked his parents. "Come on, Bart," said the interviewer. "Everyone thanks their parents when they win a gold medal." But Connor told him that this was different. He said, "Every night before bed, my parents would ask me what my success of the day was." When I was injured, I knew I was going to make it back because I was a success every day of my life. Connor's story tells us when people focus on what they are doing well, they do more things well. Number four. It was evening when I landed in Kuching, Malaysia. I felt alone and homesick. I was a 19-year-old Dubai-raised kid, away from home for the first time to start my university studies in mechanical engineering. I took my luggage and headed to the airport exit. 
I looked around and found my driver waiting for me in front of his gray van with the name of my university on it. As we left the airport, he began talking about the city and its people. As I loved driving very much, we moved on to talking about cars and driving in Kuching. Never make Kuching people angry, he warned. No road rage. Very dangerous. He then went on to list his experiences of road rage and advised me to drive very cautiously. A bit later, the car behind started to flash its lights at us. This continued more aggressively, and my driver started to panic. Honks and more flashes followed, so he pulled the van over to the roadside. My heart was pounding as the man from the car behind approached us. As he reached my window, I lowered it and then looked down at his hands to see that he was holding my wallet. I had left it in the airport, and I realized he had been trying to return it to me ever since we had left the airport. With a sigh of relief, I took my wallet and thanked him. I could imagine a horrible scenario if he had not returned it. The man welcomed me to Kuching and drove away. As my driver dropped me off, he smiled and wished me luck with my university studies. Thanks to the kindness of these strangers, the initial doubt I had had about my decision to study away from home was replaced with hope and excitement. Exercise number one to two. According to many sociologists, the study of what our society calls art can only really progress if we drop the highly specific and ideological loaded terminology of art, artworks, and artists, and replace these with the more neutral and less historically specific terms cultural forms, cultural products, and cultural producers. These cultural products, be they paintings, sculptures, Forms of music or whatever should be regarded as being made by certain types of cultural producer and as being used by particular groups of people in particular ways in specific social contexts. By using the more neutral term cultural products for particular objects and cultural producers for the people who make those objects, the sociologist seeks to break with a view. That he or she sees as having dominated the study of cultural forms for too long, namely trying to understand everything in terms of the category art. This is a category that is too limited and context specific to encompass all the different cultural products that people in different societies make and use. It is a term that is also too loaded to take at face value. And to use naively in study of our own society. Since it is in the interests of certain social groups to define some things as art and others as not, the very term art itself cannot be uncritically used by the sociologist who wishes to understand how and why such labeling processes occur. Quite simply, then, in order to study cultural matters, Many sociologists believe one has to reject the terms art, artwork, and artist as the basis for our analysis. Instead, these terms become important objects of analysis themselves. Exercise number three to four. At around one point five kilograms. The human brain is thought to be around five to seven times larger than expected for a mammal of our body size. Why do humans have such big brains? Although they only account for two percent of typical body weight, they use up twenty percent of metabolic energy. What could justify such a biologically expensive organ? An obvious answer is that we need big brains to reason. After all, a big brain equals more intelligence. But evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar has been pushing another answer, one that has to do with being sociable. 
he makes the point that big brains seem to be specialized for dealing with problems that must arise out of large groups in which an individual needs to interact with others. This is true for many species. For example, birds of species that flock together have comparatively larger brains than those that are isolated. A change in brain size can even occur within the lifespan of an individual animal, such as the locust. Locusts are normally solitary and avoid each other, but become gregarious when they enter the swarm phase. This swarm phase of the locust is triggered by the buildup of locusts as their numbers multiply, threatening food supply, which is why they swarm to move to a new location altogether. In the process, they rub against each other, and this stimulation sets off a trigger in their brain to start paying attention to each other. As they swarm and become more tuned in to other locusts around them, their brain size shrinks by some degrees. Exercise number five to seven. There was a business executive who was deep in debt and could see no way out. He couldn't borrow more money from any bank and couldn't pay his suppliers. One day, he sat on a park bench, head in hands, wondering if anything could save his company from bankruptcy. Suddenly, an old man appeared before him. I can see that something is troubling you, he said. After listening to the executive's worries, the old man said, "I believe I can help you." He asked the man his name, wrote out a check, and pushed it into his hand. He said, "Take this money. Meet me here exactly one year from today, and you can pay me back at that time." Then he turned and disappeared as quickly as he had come. The executive saw in his hand a check for five hundred thousand dollars, signed by John D. Rockefeller, then one of the richest men in the world. I can erase my money worries in an instant, he thought. But instead, the executive decided to put the check in his safe. Just knowing it was there might give him the strength to work out a way to save his business, he thought. Within a few months. He was out of debt and making money once again. Exactly one year later, he returned to the park with the check. At the agreed upon time, the old man appeared. But just then, a nurse came running up and grabbed the old man. I hope he hasn't been bothering you. He's always escaping from the rest home and telling people he's John D. Rockefeller, the nurse said. The surprised executive just stood there. Suddenly, he realized that it wasn't the money, real or imagined, that had turned his life around. It was his newfound self-confidence that enabled him to achieve anything he went after. Exercise number eight to ten. It was the first day of the new semester. Steve and Dave were excited that they would be back at school again. They rode their bicycles to school together that morning, as they usually did. Dave had math on the first floor, and Steve was on the second with history. On his way to the classroom, Steve's teacher came up to him to ask if he wanted to run for student president. Steve thought for a moment and answered, "Sure." It'll be a great experience. After class, Steve spotted Dave in the hallway and ran to him excitedly. "I've got good news! I'm going for student president, and I think mine will be the only nomination." Dave cleared his throat and replied with surprise, "Actually, I've just registered my name too." He continued sharply, "Well, best of luck." But don't think, you'll win the election, Steve. Dave walked quickly away, and from that moment on, there was an uncomfortable air of tension between the two friends.
Steve tried to be friendly toward Dave, but he just didn't seem to care. When the election day came, Steve found that his bicycle had a flat tire, so he started to run to school. Just as he reached the end of the street, Dave's dad, who was driving Dave to school, pulled over to give him a ride. The dead silence in the car made the drive painful. Noticing the bad atmosphere, Dave's dad said, You know, only one of you can win. You have known each other since birth. Don't let this election ruin your friendship. Try to be happy for each other. His words hit Dave hard. Looking at Steve, Dave felt the need to apologize to him later that day. Steve won the election. Upon hearing the result, Dave went over to Steve and congratulated him, shaking his hand. Steve could still see the disappointment burning in his eyes. It wasn't until later that evening, on the way home, that Dave said apologetically, I'm so sorry, Steve. This election hasn't damaged our friendship, has it? Of course not, Dave. We're friends as always, Steve responded with a smile. As Steve arrived home, his dad was proudly waiting for him and said, Congratulations on the win. How did Dave take it? Steve replied, We're fine now. Best friends for life. His dad laughed. Sounds like you won two battles today.